the galaxy burns. The heretic falls. And the emperor protects. Welcome, Imperial citizens, to the Emperor Protects. My name is Doug, along with my great co-host, Dan. How are you, Doug? Hey, I'm doing really good, man. Thank you so much. Uh, sorry it has been just a hot minute since our last episode. Summer was a, it was a crazy one for mm. both of us. We had a lot of traveling and uh, family stuff, so I appreciate the patience. And today, I could not be more excited, Dan. We're talking about one of my favorite books in all yes. of Black Library. <laughs> Hey, you are definitely a fanboy here when it comes to No No Fear. Yes. Oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> I uh, I haven't read it in several years, and so I forgot uh, how much I love it. So this is just a good excuse to uh, to hop right in. So um, that is our topic for the day. We're just going to be walking through the major beats of the book. As always, uh, you know, we just cover the, the broad strokes to make it condensed and and manageable i guess consumable mm -hmm. but right uh please read this book for yourself there's so many cool side stories and i don't know bits and bobs any yeah. other <laughs> any thoughts on there so uh before we jump in dan what have you been working on i know that you uh started your white scars i think you paused yes, them I, as well <laughs> i have so what i have is i think i have what would definitely pass as a 2000 point army so i have my three squads of 10 Marines. I have a squad of five special weapons. I have two Leviathans, a Contemptor Dread, and a Praetor and a Sakaran. So okay. I think all that added up would probably come pretty close to 2000 right now. Um, so that's all built and primed. I haven't done a lot of painting, but I got that part of it done. I think the only thing I want to add is maybe some uh, Terminators. Okay, uh, but otherwise, I, I think I've got enough that when I want to, you know, once I get started painting, but I certainly have enough if somebody's okay with prime stuff to to bring to a table. Yeah. Uh, but I've I've got this weird side project going on where um, I'm working on some Sigmar, a, a specific fig, you know, figure for Sigmar, mm -hmm. and it's kind of drawn me off from my heresy stuff. But I have a paint scheme. Um, I actually use Silly Putty for my masking on my leviathans and my sakaran oh cool so it it worked really well i was surprised uh, i know a lot of people are aware of it already but uh i i never used it and it it was a really pleasant surprise that's right um for uh for me i got a big order in um <laughs> and i've just been building up a, a drop pod list unfortunately it came a little late for me to be able to get mm. the entire three thousand points list but i'll be having a uh 1200 or 1500 point game of zone mortalis uh over the weekend oh, quite a few of those cool yeah so i'm excited i got all my little terminator guys and i have a lot of uh what are they despoiler squads coming out of drop pods mm -hmm. just guys with chain swords running mad uh, madmen uh, <laughs> yeah so i'm i'm pretty stoked about it it's coming along real well if you want to check that out i'll be painting a bunch of it over on uh, two plus stuff on youtube uh and that's pretty much all that I have going on. I was waiting on any other books to, to know where we wanted to go from here. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah. any other thoughts before you want to jump into today's topic? No, I'm ready to go when you are, bud. Awesome. So here here's kind of how I wanted to, to do this. Right? We were thinking about how do we explain this book to someone? Because it's, it's written in a very unusual style. Okay? Yes. Every chapter begins with a countdown or count forward. There's a zero so hour, cool. and so the so book cool. starts by counting down, and then after zero hour, it counts up. Okay? It's almost written... Uh, tell me what your thoughts on this. It's almost written like somebody was compiling an account of what happened. Yeah, it's very ultramarines you know the they're so anal it's very like we have to keep a specific record of exactly when everything happened and i i just think it's a brilliant timer as it were you know mm -hmm. to your point and what it does is it builds the tension so much that's what's just genius about it. i mean abnet starts with just putting the ultramarines and the word bears in each other's face so yep. he basically tells you what's going to happen so you know it's just with that timer you're talking about you i think we started off at like minus 130 hours or something mm -hmm. when when a specific thing happened it's you know mark of calf minus 130 point whatever it was and you know it just counts down like that and you're going 
come on, come on, come on. We know what's going to end. Yeah. And it was a really neat mechanic. I, I loved it. Yep, absolutely. And and when it's doing this, this uh, before and after, there's actually multiple perspectives that we follow mm. throughout the course of this book. Um, and so I'm going to be pivoting from one to the other pretty loosely, mm. uh, but I'll make it clear. The perspectives we have are what's going on in McCrag's honor, the capital mm. ship for the Ultramarines, if I'm not mistaken. The flagship, I think. Of flagship, yes. Okay. Gilliman, yep. I think yep. that's right, yep. Uh, so he's up there. And then uh, we also have various low... And there's a, there's a few characters going on up in that ship. Down on the planet side, on Kalth itself, there is a very important tech priest, or mm-hmm. priestess, mm-hmm. rather. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I guess I guess priest, because they don't really care about anything else, mm-hmm. but it's just machines. Mm-hmm. But uh, So there's a uh, tech priest, as well as a cadre of space marines, that we follow and there's there's a bunch of other stories that end essentially um, well you know one of the things i wanted to comment it's really interesting that you mentioned the tech priestess because yeah. you know she has a relationship with another we'll talk about what their function is but she actually has a relationship with another tech priest yep. and you you don't ever think of mechanicus people actually having relationship because they're so they're so neutral, you know, yeah. there's, there's no emotion, but their relationship was really strong. And I mean, they had a lot of interaction, which was very human. So it was, it was very interesting to see that, to create that kind of a um, character interaction. I yeah. Thought. Yeah. There was a yeah. point where it's like, I guess, I guess you would say that he was like my husband. <laughs> he doesn't really know how to handle that. Like, right. Oh, that was so fun. It was fun. Yeah. Uh, and so those are those are the major perspectives, right? We have a planet side and up in mm-hmm. the uh, yeah. starship. And so uh, let's start jumping into this. Our, our countdown begins as the Ultramarines are standing at Kalth, one of their worlds within Ultramar. And they're getting ready to basically rally their forces for a giant orc hunt. Um, <laughs> and and so the, the plan, as per... Horus's instructions is that the word bearers are going to meet up with the ultramarines and together they're gonna they're gonna bury some some skeletons and rejoin as brothers and they're gonna hunt orcs together because that's what bonding looks like in the grim darkness of the 41st century or millennium (laughs) yes yes um you know everyone's kind of apprehensive about it the ultramarines really don't seem to like the word bearers everyone thinks they're creepy and, uh, you know, they don't do anything to dissuade that opinion of them. <laughs> and no, no. Gilliman the entire time is just going through and be like, everyone just be cool. Like, we're, we're trying to build some bonds of brotherhood. It's going to be fine. Mm-hmm. This family vacation is going to fix everything, said every disappointed dad ever. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be great. Um, the, the word bearer forces are kind of trickling in. And when our story picks up, Essentially, they're mustering. So ships are going down to the planet uh, from both ultramarines and word bearers to rearm, rest, you know, um, they basically just get themselves ready for this orc invasion, right? They send mm-hmm. titans down to go get work done and repaired and all this kind of stuff. Um, and uh, Lorgar is not quite there yet. He's like, oh, just I'll be like another hour or two, whatever. Mm-hmm. Um and, and and that's kind of where things stand. Uh, any notable characters at this point when things are cool? I, you know, one of the things I thought was interesting was Gilliman actually expresses his resentment of being ordered to destroy Monarchia, and that's so unusual for him to do something like that. You know, it's at least that's the perception I get, you know, is that he really is sorry for having had to do that. He doesn't understand why the emperor asked him or told him to do that. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I think in a way it feeds into his cautiousness, which is unusual. And he's usually, he knows what's going on. He's very aware of his surroundings. And I think he, he doesn't say or do things that he probably would do out of caution because he's kind of, you know, trying to, as you said, trying to, you know, get ready for the vacation with his brother. Yeah. Uh, and and so, see these conversations go on. 
uh, and like between him and Lorgar, you know, he he says something to Lor he brings something up to Logar Lorgar, and we're going to talk about it a little later, and. Lorgar's you can just tell Lorgar's like oh I think he found me out so he gets real offended yeah you know <laughs> and then all of a sudden Gilliman's on the defensive he's like oh sorry brother I didn't mean it that way it's just like wow he's trying and, yeah 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 and you just never see that in him so it was very interesting I think yeah um, he got very flustered <laughs> yes yeah he did uh I think a couple other characters of interest we have an ultramarine sergeant named Aenid Thiel Yep. And he is just amazing because, uh, and, and there are a lot of, for the listeners, side stories. Uh, I think the first one was Censure. It's a short story about Thiel. And he was unusual for a couple of reasons. One, when we meet him, he's wearing a red helmet. And you're going, what? What's that about? Well, at that time in the Ultramines, it was the mark of Censure. And then you're going, well, why did they censure this guy? It was because he basically was running war games based on space marines fighting space marines and that yep. was just like heresy to the ultramarines they're like what are you doing that would never happen that's just unacceptable so they censured him for doing that and <laughs> we find out <laughs> that Thiel is actually an out-of-the-box thinking genius yes uh, eventually but uh he's a really neat character and again i love that he's throughout the uh uh the story uh another character i thought was interesting was telemachus and these are loyalists of course telemachus is a a dreadnought mm -hmm. but abnet how does he bring out human qualities in a dreadnought you just never, all you ever hear is this, like, his voice out of a mm -hmm. box emitter. And he's just, he's like young, I guess, in an age, like literally young, you know, in terms yeah. of being put into this thing. He had only and been in a combat squad for, like, a yeah, very well, short amount of time. Yeah, and he's, like, disappointed that he's not old enough to be a venerable dreadnought. He doesn't consider himself worthy. And I'm going, wow, that is so cool that yeah. he would write a dreadnought from that perspective. That that was really neat. So yep. yeah, yeah. So they, they were just like, we need this type of vehicle or asset. Shove the newbie into it. <laughs> and then he's like, yeah. well, I, I thought this was supposed to be an honorable position. He's like, it is until we just need a guy. <laughs> uh, another another person I thought was interesting was it's actually uh, he's with the word bearers. His name is Faust. Yes. And I think this is his observations are very interesting because one of the things that he brings up is he notes how as opposed to, say, the Ultramarines or Imperial Space, you know, Loyalist Space Marines who recruit Imperial Army regiments to serve with them, the word bearers have been going on this jag to recruit non-regular forces, which they're calling heathen militia, heathen auxiliaries. And it's like, cultists, anyone? Like, yeah. Yep. But they're not calling them that. But it was really neat to see that observation because eventually in the book we're going to get to that but um it it was a neat way to introduce the fact that they were doing something so unusual in terms of recruiting just masses of bodies yes yep um, I and that was neat. uh and and lastly we have our, our tech priestess who oh, ha has, yes. a, has a full uh i guess character arc in my opinion she's really cool Mm -hmm. I can't recall yes. her name because I can't remember all these crazy names. But um, so they're 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 mid muster. There's a whole bunch of word bearers both in space, the mm -hmm. spaceport of Kalth, which is really what the planet really has become. It's it's a mega spaceport. Mm -hmm. uh, is is hustling and bustling. Every single deck and uh, stuff is open. They're all moving troops. Everything's busy. And uh, we meet some of our human characters with just their count. No, they're precise timing because they're ultramarines on like mm. how long it takes to offload and reload ships and there's some kind of delay yes. and so they're sending small lieutenants out to go see what's up like you know it's just day-to-day -day stuff of, of mm. mustering an army on such a scale i mean these are colossal mm. i don't know i i don't know how big this is supposed to be compared to olinor but it's a huge muster there's a, there's a lot going on 
Um, and so uh, we, we start to see a lot of the, the cracks start to show as the ultramarine forces and their human auxiliaries get their first glimpse at uh, the word bearers. Like they look disheveled, they look dirty, they use, yeah, like you were mentioning all the human auxiliaries that we would say now are cultists, but at that point didn't exist. So, <laughs> right. um, and we get a, a glimpse into how Kalth runs. Essentially, there is mm -hmm. an orbital relay station, uh, a giant computer that feeds directly into a tech priest's brain. And he mm -hmm. is coordinating all of the just ship traffic. Every time anything needs to happen, that sends like an alert signal and he has to approve it. He is just this crazy genius when it comes to manipulating such a, uh, a spaceport of such scale. Mm -hmm. um, and he starts to notice there's some weird things happening as the word bearer ships arrive. He calls it scrap code. And this would be like, I, I guess, the equivalent of if today you tried patching software and if everyone has multiple versions and it's all patched differently, when you put it together, sometimes mm -hmm. the software fails. That's my uh, non-programmer. I mean, I've, I've dabbled, but <laughs> sure. that's the basics of it. And so, uh, you know, they're just kind of sending a warning like, hey, got some weird stuff going on with scrap code. You guys just kind of check your systems. This is where you mentioned Lorgar gets very offended. Like, you assume we bring crappy computer technology to your planet and poison you? And Gilliman's like, no, you loser. I'm just giving you a heads up. <laughs> um and so they have this great conversation there. And uh, at a certain point, we learn there's something very peculiar about this code. Mm -hmm. um, essentially, at one point, a, the Admech uh, guy in charge of the planetary defense has to put it on sort of like AI control just for a little bit. Mm -hmm. And when he does that, all hell breaks loose. Mm -hmm. So are we ready to move forward? Yeah, I think so. Okay, so all of this has been going down while our countdown has been steadily declining. Mm. And it comes to the zero hour. And mm. when that happens, a ship known as the Campanile, which is a small, sort of a freighter. A bulk freighter, yeah. Yeah, um, fires up his engines and goes to just a dang near as fast as the thing can go and still be like sub light speed. Sure. It just fires off the engines and careens straight into the Calf airport or spaceport. Yeah. Oh. Now, it, in space, and I love the way that he really went into painful detail about it. There's so much inertia in in, in this ship's. Oh. It turns into just a ball of death. Yeah. So, it crashes into one ship, but because it's space. All those things just keep moving. And so one freighter crashing into a spaceport with how busy it is causes a devastating amount of damage. Mm. And and while it's happening, you know, they were like, oh, we're at our home base. Um, our sensors aren't alerting us to any enemies nearby. So no one has shields up. Like, it's they're just chilling. Oh. Oh, and so this, this ship, the Camp of Neely, goes tearing through. And that was my favorite scene of the book is just... It, it, it's it's diabolical because the space marines are sitting there looking at this and they're like okay well clearly this is some kind of digital error right like somebody fired up the engines like what the heck or maybe the scrap code did it or something they can't really mm -hmm. figure it out they're not putting the story together and at the same time all the word bearer ships go ballistic they just start immediately firing off missiles um yeah, I mean, it just gets, it goes insane. And this is just in space. Right. Um, do you want to take what happens on ground? Well, I wanted to talk, if it's okay, with the, the scrap code and where it actually came from. Yes, please. Which is interesting, I think, because you mentioned how it kind of started niggling its way into the systems. Well, it turns out that the word bearers are, are creating this scrap code on the surface. Yes. They're doing these... Uh, sacrificial rituals all over the planet and basically they're sending these the words and the screams and all these you know demonic things over the vox network and people to your point earlier was they're just like ah, what you know kind of tap your earphone like what what yep. is that you know but it gets louder it, it's kind of an exponential thing you know the whole 
you know, imagine the number eight, of course, because it's chaos, you know, eight times eight times eight, and it keeps getting that bigger and bigger and until eventually it just blows its way into the system. And the thing that's crazy about it to me, Doug, is that literally it's demons. Yes. Like, like the the scrap code. And, and the other thing that's kind of funny, I think this is the first time I ever heard that term. Scrap code? Yes. It, that's the first time I can remember hearing it. I know we had, like in Mechanicus, which we're going to eventually talk about that book. Um, it was in there. But, like, it's just, it's a demonic, chaotic, possessed form of computer language and you know so to you were asking like the ultramarines are going what happened on this ship well basically it was possessed yep <laughs> it was just like oh my god the way he was describing how these rituals were taking place and the effect they had to create this possession of this of the orbital grid was kind of frightening almost yeah yeah so at the same time as campanile goes off uh the scrap code that you're talking about it basically lets out a demonic shriek and any uh, admech character who's plugged into anything orbital anything oh. that this code could touch um basically if it was on the internet uh, to put it really bluntly yeah. like, in our modern way uh, immediately they all had like cerebral hemorrhages and stroked oh. out like it mm -hmm. just <laughs> It just killed anybody who was plugged in. Um, mm -hmm. Our main uh, Magos, who tried to plug himself back in to like regain control of the system, he has the same fate, but before he does so, he leaves a cryptic message to his uh, counterpart or assistant, uh, our female tech priest that we talked about before, who we're going to yes. continue with going forward. Yep. Um. So it's it's just deeply fascinating. Uh, they die. They can't get a hold of it. And at this point, the there's no defense at all for the Ultramarines. The orbital system is down. Everything's yes. shut down. None of the yep. shields were up. Um, the traders are just opening fire with everything on the ground, oh. beyond the code, killing a whole bunch of admet characters, which is kind of like mentioned in the background, but is mm. very significant. <laughs> um Everything just erupts. All those ships that were bringing word bearer troops and space marines and, you know, for R and R or just reammunition and supply, all of them just start marching in these well columned formations, when nobody else is ready for it. And the rest of the population is just chilling, doing their jobs. You know, Imperium sucks mm -hmm. enough. And then the uh, Ultramarines and the Loyalist forces were just going about their jobs, and so. <laughs> They weren't prepared for armored column, you know, columns to come through the city. And so immediately, uh, one of my favorite scenes is there's two, there's a space marine from the word bearers and one from the ultramarines having a conversation. Oh. And um, basically the idea was like, you know, if I were to betray my brother, I need to find a way to make it the biggest betrayal possible. Like he's basically having this, he's giving him the thesis oh, statement. Of it was, like, um, Chule and, and yeah. Orius. I think that word bearer of the Ultramarine. Yeah. They're having dinner or something. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Um, and basically <laughs> when, when the timer hits zero, uh, the word bearer just pulls out a plasma pistol and just takes his head off or whatever. Like it was just, just brutal. Yes. He was just, Oh, that was, yeah. Oh, oh um, man. I love that scene. So there was that. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, point is Kalth erupts into flames now at first uh we'll, we'll go with our space perspective initially um and feel free to jump in dan whenever you think of something no, sure 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 so gilliman is like what the ever loving hell <laughs> and and yeah, yeah because even in that snapshot within the first 10 minutes uh the ultramarines are effectively crippled I mean, this thing has torn yes. straight through their entire spaceport with most of their ships. So, like, no matter what, they're at least out of the game for a little bit. Um, and so he tries to ring up Lorgar. And Lorgar is very cryptic and vague. You know, um, wow. he kind of dodgy. There's several phone calls that they have. But this one he's a little bit dodgy on. And um, Gilliman essentially broadcasts as much as he can uh, to whoever he can. Hey, listen, um, you have a chance to repent. 
lay down your arms now and the ultramarines won't fight back basically mm-hmm. uh, the problem is the vox network meaning the communications array is down it's all messed up with the scrap code ultramarines can't mm-hmm. really communicate so they can't form a resistance um i loved i don't know about you the drama on the ship like at the actual helm of gilliman being like where are my communications like he's he's going through his orders of this is the priority and then he like lists things like in order of priority <laughs> which is yes. really fun yes. um it's just man there's just a lot and so uh they're getting pelted by word bearer ships and he's basically trying to get the orbital defense relay online but there's no way to do it without a full system reset yes and so that's kind of where the first section of the the orbital perspective ends. I think one of the other things we talked about the rituals, the smaller kind of decentralized rituals all over the planet to create the scrap code. Yes. The one other thing that's huge is the grand ritual that the word bearers, and I believe that Erebus was in charge of this one. Yes, yes, that Erebus. Uh, and... Uh, they're they've actually brought stones like stuff from Istvan. They harvested gene seed, the word bears from Istvan. And you're just going, that is just so gross and horrific that they would do this and this grand ritual that they're conducting. And one of the things I think is weird, Doug, is how like the Ultramines didn't see any of this going on. Like yeah it's happening everywhere it made me i know there were one point where there was some like imperial troops and other people were watching the you know like the word bearers camp and like that's just weird what are they doing but this grand ritual they're doing is huge and it's designed to actually sacrifice kalf's son and that'll be very important closer to the end of the book but it's a very, very important piece of something that's going on in the background that as the tension builds in the story, this thing continues to grow in size and strength. Yes. So and I we'll, just thought that was, was worthwhile. Absolutely. And I want to, that's definitely going to come up towards the end of the story because that ritual is called the ruin storm, which is the mm-hmm. coolest name for anything. I mean, yeah. that's just amazing. But, uh, so yeah, it goes on a little, uh, a little bit and then, uh, our perspective changes back down to our uh, lady tech priest and the space marines who just happened to find her essentially uh and 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 really what their thing is is the captain who finds him do you have his name handy uh it's uh oh it's venatus i wait a minute i got it here somewhere in my notes uh yeah, Ventatus. Ventatus, Captain yes. Ventatus, yep, that's him. Yep, so he finds the tech priest and is like, okay, we need to get communications. That's the number one priority. What are we doing? And tech priest, they kind of come up with solutions. And, and one of my favorite parts of this of this book, I'm going to sum up a few different things. Okay. Is they constantly are saying, what is our priority? Where do we achieve that? Let's go take it. Okay, and then everybody mm-hmm. just defends the tech priest until she gets her job done. That happens like mm-hmm. four times in this story between various locations, but I'm just going to kind of cram them all. Yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah, sure. Um, but over time, what we're seeing is just some really cool interaction between the priests of Mars and space marines who are just like, mm-hmm. what, you know, there's a lot of things going on. And um, so their first mission immediate communication array they find a local basically radio station <laughs> and um it has some some vox channels she creates an encrypted network so now the good guys have at least a, a radio signal they can do something um it only works locally it's like more like a, a short wave radio than internet but uh it, it works for a bit and mm-hmm. then the next thing is well, how do we get the orbital defense back online? Because if we have that, we can just nuke them. Like, just mm-hmm. straight up. And so a lot of the book uh, is them trying to find ways. The biggest thing is they need a computer that can handle that much power, right? Computation, mm-hmm. whatever you want, the bandwidth. Yes. And the little tiny radio station they have can't do it. 
So right. where do we find an, a computer that was not connected to the network when all this happened, but is also powerful enough to run the orbital platform stuff? Yeah, this is where that relationship between the tech priestess and the tech priest we talked about earlier, Yep. Um, their relationship, the last thing he told her was about a kill code. Yes. And that's what they're looking for. That's what they're going to try in, to have her inject into, because the kill code will, what you said earlier, reset everything and just burn out the scrap code. Yep, exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so that's the idea. They have they have firewall technology. Now we got to go plug the USB in and take control back of ours. <laughs> yeah, that's that's basically yeah. Basically it. Uh, and so then they set their sights on basically a, a relay station. But what's great is uh, as they're looking for a computer that can run this, she remembers. Yeah, her her husband, not husband, uh, of the mechanicum who just recently died. And basically discerns that he had kept a, we'll say an extra computer in a storage locker Mm -hmm. uh, over by the docks. And so it was his personal thing. It was for his own research and projects, which is the Mechanicus would absolutely do. Mm -hmm. And so basically once she finds her late partner's uh, computer, that is when they are able to introduce the purge code, regain control of some measure of the network. And... Mm -hmm. Essentially, what's happening is our perspective pings between the McCrags honor and this group of survivors as they have to kind of work in tandem to secure objectives to get the orbital relay back online. It, it felt like watching a tennis match, man. It just. Yeah, exactly. On the surface, in space, on the surface, in space. Yeah, it but was, it's... it was good, but it, it made the story, like every time it happened, it refreshed the story. Yes. Because you were getting to a point on the surface, like, yeah, 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 okay. And it's part of that tension thing where, yeah, yeah, we get it. Go, what's next? And then, boom, all of a sudden they take you to another place where, oh, my gosh, that's happening. Yeah. Um, one of the things, too, on the surface while all this is going on that I I found kind of interesting. So we, we've got this uh, phenomenon now where the word bears, the space marines, are – you know, moving towards objectives, specific objectives, trying to wipe out, massacre, shatter, scatter the Ultramarines, whatever it is. But they're just, the Ultramarines are encountering waves and waves of these, we're going to call them cultists now. They're just hordes of bodies yeah. that the word bearers are throwing at them. And we also find, interestingly enough, that they're armed with these fun little knives, these fun little hobby knives. And we we are introduced to anathemas, and that's what these things are, mm-hmm. literally. Um, and so it, it was just the picture of this happening and how the Ultramarines were just being overwhelmed on one hand. This is what I, I kind of perceive. On the other hand, I thought it was really cool that the ultramarines here despite the fact that they are being overrun and scattered the way that they are organized and the discipline that mm-hmm. they have as a fighting force helps them to actually decentralize their resistance and hold out in these pockets uh, where most groups, I mean, even, you know, we'll talk about what's happening to the word bearers that we see, you know, this, this degradation in the word bearers themselves. But the the ultramarines are able to is, eventually form a resistance because these pockets are acting in little, like little tactical squads or little yep. tactical units, operational units. And because of who they are and, and their training and their doctrines, they're able to stop a lot of this stuff once the the tide comes in. It kind of, you know, boom, it's done. Yeah, you're absolutely. finished. And and I just thought that was really cool to see that um, contrast. Yes, 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 yes. So, um, the surface to yeah, exactly. And on that point, so as the attack goes, it certainly starts fully in favor of of the traitors. I mean, the whole, oh. the, the word bears. Caught him by surprise and, and kicked him. Not so much in the face, but more the groin area. And uh, <laughs> yeah. 
and they had they had so many legs up but the problem is is that they get very distracted by go, starting to to dip into their chaos rituals and stuff oh, um yeah. the ruin storm is one others they just start to lose discipline and so they just you know i mm. i want to go hunt ultramarines because they insulted me and this is no longer about following orders this is about glory and, and and offerings to the chaos gods and all that kind of stuff and so they lose cohesion but cohesion is the ultimate strength of the ultramarines and mm-hmm. so if two ultramarines find each other and shake hands they become like two brain cells working in one brain like it's just immediate on board uh, and one of the things that's interesting I love about this story is we often think of the Ultramarines as like very regimented, like chain of command. Mm. But when Kalf happens, the person who is in charge of a given group of survivors is not the highest ranking necessarily. It, it can yes. be. Yeah. But oftentimes it's who in a practical sense is the best person for this job. Um, and And as we... Our, our focus switches from planet side to the ship. Um, our captain, who was sitting outside the principal's office, for daring to think that space marines should learn how to fight space marines. <laughs> yeah, Sergeant Thiel. Yeah. Yes, Thiel, and okay. uh, he he is shows this very well. Of like, yeah, he's he's a higher ranking dude, but he basically takes full command of the ship's defenses. I yes. mean, just making sure nothing gets on McCrag's honor, and it's because. He's better at fighting them. He's like, oh, mm. yes, they've been dropping demons onto our ship. Mm. Uh, and I found out, just, just through a little observation, that melee works better than guns. So he raids Gilliman's armory and takes all the best <laughs> weapons. great. Um, oh. Yeah, he, he walks in like Ash from Evil Dead with his boomstick <laughs> and is just like, Yes! <laughs> heard you guys have a demon problem right to the crowd. <laughs> heart of mccrag's honor it's just like oh yeah dude yeah um yeah you know but that kind of stuff where he's a practical thinker and because he's the right person and he walks in with a plan everyone just immediately is like on board and like that's that's their strength <laughs> yeah i think another thing in the, in the grand scheme you know on the word bearer side is we start reading passages every once in a while that kind of helps us understand that there's a grand scheme here Yes. On the, it's not just destroy the Ultramarines. Like, there's this. There are three major sacrifices that I read into this story. First is the sun. They want to sacrifice the sun. Yep. They want to sacrifice the Ultramarines, and then of course they want to sacrifice their Primarch. And the the three big players here, which is Lorgar, Erebus, and uh, Bad Daddy Corferon, right? Yeah. <laughs> they they want these things to happen not for the Legion. And it and for Lorgar, it, it never was about the Legion. It was always about Lorgar. It's always been about Lorgar. Right. They want to to go closer to Ascension, you know? They'd all just love to be demon princes. You can just tell it's in yep. there somewhere. And so we have this kind of top-down look at what they're trying to do and those are their targets yeah we want to destroy the marines we want to get gilliman so we can sacrifice and want to try to capture him on his flagship perfect and then we want to blow up the sun too so i, I just thought it was it because it reads into the story as we continue to move forward yes so, yes yes, yeah. yes yeah it's good to know what everyone's priorities are <laughs> yeah well yeah so uh, sure. yeah and for the space uh, for the ultramarines rather uh it is definitely uh, regaining communication and pushing back now at a certain point all of our space marine heroes are like uh we are very doomed so we're gonna make you this is gonna hurt you as much as possible on our doomed journey mm. right they're they're gonna mm-hmm. be playing violins while the titanic sinks kind of a deal and so they get their um, communications back there is a scene that i wanted to touch on on the bridge where lorgar has a second phone call with gilliman and ends yeah. with Lorgar getting really angry. He has his nasty face and he snarls and uh, Gilliman's like, eh, turn it off. I don't want to look at him anymore. At this point, he's already written off his brother. He's like, I want to kill you. Um, and so the uh, feed is cut, but the image of Lorgar doesn't go away and <sighs> actually becomes a demon that like 
the scrap uh, the code sent the demon through their ethernet and uh, aboard the ship and they uh, got attacked on the bridge uh, the gosh. bridge explodes and Gilliman is tossed into the space uh, above yes. his planet and so that's like the all is lost moment <laughs> yes yeah um but because of the actions of what's going on on ground um the space marines first of all can coordinate okay so I keep saying space marines ultramarines can coordinate in in small measure they can't really see each other well but they can like hear and receive basic commands and so some resistance is building uh they have troops kind of coming together mm -hmm. random tank crews or maybe what we would call imperial guard heavy weapons crews mm -hmm. coming together mm -hmm. basically trying to secure the computer that they have to run the orbital defense network one uh, of the things to your point you, you talked about their communication slowly improving it was related to an interesting thing is as they're moving through things they're kind of finding more and more skatari that they're kind of just you know pulling into their groups yes and the skatari have their own hardened Vox network yes. that, that is isolated from all the scrap code. So as the Marines pick these guys up, they can start talking to other groups of Marines. As you said, it's much more local, but it allows them to actually start communicating now yep. because they have this separate hardened uh, communications. Yeah, you have, we have safe walkie-talkies in the yes. Mechanicus. That's... <laughs> uh basically what it comes down to yes um and with all this back and forth of our perspectives again the tide begins to turn as the the word mm. bearers become less cohesive and they all focus on their individual plans much as lorgar is focusing on his individual one of what you mentioned right his goals mm -hmm. and sure. as that happens the balance begins to tip not in favor of the ultramarines but certainly in favor of not being wiped out easily <laughs> yes. yes um because at this point they, they've lost so much stuff i mean we didn't even cover the multiple ships like flagship <sighs> level things falling out of the sky each one of them is a planet killer in terms of the amount of devastation Ugh. um the ritual with the sun starts to go off and now it's bombarding kalth with uh, radiation so everybody has to run underground and uh, near the end of our story the, the overwhelming majority of the inertia that the word bearers had has been spent they've, they've they've exhausted their element of surprise the ultramarines are now in control of their own grid and are able to fight back uh, Corferon hops uh, sorry Gilliman um, is is rescued he, somehow he can breathe in space because Primark powers. Yeah, I, it was really weird. That is a really good thing to bring up. It's like you wonder if there's like this small atmosphere that's maintained around the ship or something. Yeah, you know, that's maybe but, twenty, you know, ten meters high or something that he could. And while he's out there, Doug, the fun thing was is he was just kicking the crap out of any word bears that were trying to come and board his ship. Yep. He's, like, he wasn't just out there floating around. He was, like, just tearing things up, ships and marines and everybody who tried to attach themselves. He was like, no, no, no. Yes, not today. yeah. One of our heroes goes outside to stop uh, onboarders, and he just sees Gilliman ripping heads off of word bearers yeah. with no helmet on its base. Uh, and, and to your point, yes, I did read somewhere else. The idea was that the flagship is so big and it was so close to cal that it basically brought in part of its atmosphere a little mm. bit i mean it's you okay. know it's all plot armor but gilliman's out there just popping heads off left and right like a madman which is cool yep um and let's see uh he it comes back inside they come up with a plan okay we need you to go above uh go aboard a word bearer ship and and basically stop the ruin storm from happening right mm -hmm. they're trying to shut it all down so he goes aboard um which i thought was a dumb idea but whatever <laughs> send a primark to do it whatever um and and there he has a fight with our boy core pharaon of the word uh, bearers you want to tell me about this fight I, it's just it's so interesting because if you if you read like other things that have happened, like in the Indominus books, you know, that uh, Guy Haley has written, 
where Gilliman is fighting against Nurgle's people in the you know 41st millennium, um, you realize that he's not like he's not immune to psychic powers. No. So the warp, you know, and so uh, I think when you talked about it, they tell they did a teleportarian thing, like a teleport assault, and they came on board Corferon's ship, and there was not just Corferon, there was like a whole company of Galvor back. Now, you know, we mentioned that before. This is not the possessed Marines. This isn't like Argal Tal or anything, but they are veterans. I mean, these are really well-trained and motivated uh, word bearers that are kind of the bodyguard of Corferon. And Gilliman just like, boom, he's just like, he's kind of like that ship. He just tears through everything to get to Corferon. Like there, there are all these space Marines in his way. It just rips Not anymore. through them. <laughs> Not anymore. And so he's barging his way through trying actually what he's trying to do is get to the cogitators because yes. he wants to shut down because they know where the cogitator is. If they can shut down the one that Corferon has on his, uh, actually, I think, aren't they on the orbital? I think they're on an orbital platform. That's yes, kind I'm of sorry, the relay. Right. Yes. right, that's right. Um, if they can shut that one down, then the, it'll all come back up, but they've got to shut that one down first. So he's trying to break through with that. And uh, Theo that we talked about, he's kind of in there fighting and doing his thing with his Primarch. And all of a sudden, Corferon kind of steps in the way. And you're thinking, this is like Bad Daddy Corferon. Like, what is he going to do against the Prime? Well, this is not the Corferon that we know. This is a guy who is just infused with the warp. And he is incredibly powerful in terms of his ability to manipulate the warp, use warp powers. You know, think of kind of like a super librarian kind of a thing. And he basically just stops Gilliman in his tracks. And you're going, oh my, really? Like, <laughs> yeah. And so what he does, and this is the part was totally unexpected to me. He pulls out an anathema. And you're going, oh yeah, I remember what happened the last time they stabbed the Primarch with an anathema. Uh, Horus, you know. And I think you could just tell that Corferon was like, hey, if I stab this guy with this, I can turn him. He just knows right. he's thinking it, right? All I got to do is wound him with this thing, and it's good. Well, the mistake he's making, I thought, when I was reading it, is like, don't, you don't, as smart as you think you are, you don't understand this anathema in your hand is not the same anathema that was made specifically for Horus. This is just... It's bad, but it's not that kind of bad. Yes. So he gets close enough, of course, to use the knife. And this is just like, oh, when you're reading it, you're going, oh, my God. So Cullivan basically punches him in the chest with a power fist. Yes. <laughs> like, yes, and we get to see the power that. of a strength 10 <laughs> Primark power fist or whatever. I mean, this thing's like a foot across, right? And he just slams it into his chest. He pulls out his primary heart, and you're going, oh, God, finally we got rid of Corferon. Well, wait a minute. Wait a minute, listeners. He is, he does have a secondary heart, right? say, Yeah, he's got a spare. <laughs> <laughs> he's got, yeah, right. And, and of course, the, the piece here is, even though his chest has a foot-wide hole in it, his heart is missing, because villains of quality are really hard to find in good stories... <laughs> He has to survive. So even though he has this huge piece of adamantium shoved into his torso, he manages to get away and he rips, uses the anathema. He rips a hole in reality. He steps through and he gets away. Uh, which, but the whole description of this confrontation between the two, I thought was just so, such good reading. Oh yeah, it was like yeah, I, I, so powerful. Gilliman's like you shouldn't monologue, dude, and just like cakes him real hard. <laughs> it's what it was. <laughs> he was he was monologuing real hard. It was and and this is this was the other thing. Remember you talked about the two Marines that were having the the conversation, and the word bearer was talking to the Ultramarine Chule, I think his name was, uh, was the word bearer, and so we get some 
vindication here because Chule is one of the Gal Vorbeck that's defending Corferon, yep. and Thiel basically <laughs> just comes up to the guy and just shoves his sword right into his yep. right into his head, and he just like, oh god, at least that guy died. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> And then he runs over after that, of course, and he shoves his sword into the cogitator and it just goes. Yep. Um, and now we're able to upload the kill code. Yeah. So that's kind of what that whole battle was. Yes. I mean, and that, and that is really what it, that's kind of where it starts to taper out uh, story wise is um, the the ruin storm, the big spell that Lorgar wanted to do was completed i mean to an extent the the sun was nuked and now it is destabilized uh calf is functionally dead there's a huge warp storm that's rolling in because of the the ritual that threatens to keep the ultramarines pinned there indefinitely Mm -hmm. and you have to remember that at this point gilliman doesn't really know everything that's going on around him is this just the word bears like they have some in other Mm. books they get some they have some clues, but they don't know the full scale of what's going on. And so yes. uh, they make the difficult decision of, like, literally anything that's in a ship or can fly. Get it up here. We're leaving before the storm sets in. And mm-hmm. uh, that's essentially what they do. They have to just bolt, and Kalth is left to be irradiated as a wasteland mm-hmm. for centuries. But funny enough, the fight's actually not actually over there. It just went underground, which is why the old... Mm-hmm. Horus Heresy starter set of Betrayal at Kalth was a game that takes place underground. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, it, yep. Which I thought was a cool little touch. But Well, uh, and you're, to your point, there's a, a collection of story, short stories. It's a book that makes sense because of what we talked about. It's called The Mark of Kalth. Yes. And it's all about the underground war. Uh, and we meet Thiel again, and we meet other characters that if you read this book, you'll recognize people. Uh, and it's it's if you enjoy No No Fear, you would enjoy Bat, The Mark yeah. of Calf, which is really good. And I can't rate this book high enough because we glossed over so many scenes oh. that are just incredible and sad. And like, mm. I don't know, it is cool. Um, it was very well written. Yeah, you know, we talked about Venatus or Ventatus a little bit. I mean, there's a huge part of the story, which we're not going to go into the details, where, you know, they they get to this place where they can upload the code, and literally there's an entire word bearer's army waiting for them. You know, they they push aside the guards of this place, but and then once they get control of the orbital grid, all this stuff is happening. There's just as you you put it earlier, there's just thousands upon thousands of marines and cultists and imperial guard and titans are involved and it's just really cool to have all that happening uh, in the story and makes it makes part of it part of the richness of this story besides what we've talked about absolutely and um, uh you know you mentioned the uh, the character dreadnought before he f- uh, basically falls out of the sky and has to be cracked open out of his egg by an, uh, an ultramarine hero. And you're like, well, that guy's having a rough day. Okay. <laughs> yes. Tell me, Marcus, but he's so good. Um, so as a postscript, and I think it's great. You know, I, I mentioned in our notes, I think the best subtitle for this is, um, you know, Monarchia Avenged. That's yeah. what this really is about. And uh, as a postscript though, after Calf, the Thirteenth Legion, the Ultramarines actually went to Colchis, the home, home World Bear's home planet, and they burned it to the ground. Oh yeah! And and because they were so angry, they actually destroyed the planet with cyclonic torpedoes. They didn't just burn it; they destroyed the planet. Yeah. Like this is, this is bad stuff. Um, so yeah, it just, you know, part of this story that I think is really interesting too, is that I, this is one of the first books where the, now we have to put this in perspective, Doug. I mean, this is actually like the 19th book in the series. You know, we've, we, and we said this in all fairness, you were very, very clear that we were going to be jumping around a little bit. Um, But it really, to me, as you're reading it is one of the first times that, 
the loyalists actually seem to know what the hell's going on and that they actually fight back because most of the time they're just they're done they're overwhelmed yeah. and it's over and then chaos moves on uh, and that's one of the things i liked about it too how uh you know the the loyalists actually won for a change you know it's like istvan three oh they got their butts kicked. istvan five oh god not again yeah and just <laughs> again and again and again and you're reading first heretic you had talked about that well that didn't work out so well for the loyalists yeah <laughs> yeah no i i agree it, it was it was a big deal to have like they are competent and i loved the the sequence of like we get to learn what's going on with the ultramarines mm. whereas mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. i felt like in in terms of the the battle sequences we already knew what was happening in the earlier stuff right because we followed and we, we learned about the heresy from Gavriel Loken's perspective with the original mm -hmm. three books but it's different when all you see is the opposition and so being able to get Gilliman's perspective of like what's happening and their steps yes. to start turning the tide backward it was really cool um it made for some very compelling stories and yes. it just made me like the ultramarines and that's a that's a tall ask yeah that's true <laughs> you know <laughs> that is true but one of the things yeah. that they have as a reoccurring I, I guess motif or something like that about the the faction is whenever they give information they will say um practical theoretical and what they oh. mean is practical is what's actually happening theoretical is my hypothesis based on the practical mm -hmm. so they're like uh practical these monsters dematerialize when we kill them okay theoretical they are things of the warp so that's an example mm -hmm. um and just to see because you, you really not only get a sense of what the ultramarines are like but also their thought process of like what the heck is happening and then they just kind of go through all these various scenarios and they're like okay well x and y that was definitely intentional there's no way that could have been an accident um you know, and they have to piece together what's truly happening to them. Another thing that kind of struck me here was how it was the first time when I started seriously questioning the Emperor's uh, intelligence. I mean, you know, you can say that this was treachery. It, it was in, in the purest form, right? But... You know, what the Ultramarines did to the people of Kor and the people of Monarchia, there was no warning. Nobody knew what was going to happen. The word bearers had no idea. And all of a sudden, the Ultramarines show up, and they give these people, at least they gave the people seven days. <laughs> yeah. The, the word bearers didn't give the Ultramarines any time. But at the end of it, if you didn't move out, they literally just destroyed this planet with no warning. It destroyed it. And just killed a bazillion human beings. And you're going, well, I'd be kind of pissed too. Yeah. Like, why would I not be angry about that? That's not even counting all the humiliation and everything that the word bearers went through. So when I kind of stepped back and I thought about that is as creepy and as horrible as they have become as, you know, chaos Marines, you kind of go, oh, you know what? You guys kind of deserve this. Like, oh yeah, I, I don't, I don't hold this against the word bears, uh, as much as I would have if I hadn't had that other context. Absolutely, of knowing what was going on, you know. Yep. So, yeah. Um, other so, notable things here. Anything else you want to tack on um, here? I just one of the things i i know eventually i think we're going to talk about legion because it's the alpha you know, it's alpha legion we'll talk about the book eventually one of the characters that listeners as you're reading through the book um just a brief mention of a guy named john grammaticus and he is a very central character in the book legion which coincidentally was also written by dan abnett uh and he is a perpetual which means he can't die he's he's a human being who cannot Ooh. die uh, and uh, he, his loyalties change because in the original book, he was kind of manipulated into siding with the chaos side. And uh, 
he has some very specific impact on the heresy story. It's not like this huge thing that he affects everything, but in very specific cases, he helps move the story forward. And so I just wanted to mention him. So when you read the book or listen to it and John Grammaticus comes up, you'll understand that he's part of the overall story of the heresy and he does contribute in some pretty very important ways, I think. Yep. So, yep. 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 Anyway. Um, yeah. I mean, and beyond that, honestly, the, the book is great for descriptions of chaos entities. Mm -hmm. Um, cause we're, we're learning alongside all of our defenders about what's going on. So there's just, I can't say enough good things about it. The book is fantastic. And, yes. uh, we yes. didn't cover, uh, oh, but a portion no. of it. No, not at all. So any other thing you want to yeah. add here as we no. kind of come up or postscript or anything? No, I think, I think that's good. And, uh, for our next, uh, video, as, as folks are always asking here in the comments, what are we going to be reading next, Dan? I think we're going to give Mechanicum a try. Yes, they just got because, a fancy new book. Yeah, right? Uh, in in the game, it does, yes. And I just think we mentioned, Doug, you know, some stuff with the Mechanicum here, with the tech priests and, and the Skitari and stuff. So, uh, and other things we've mentioned, how they've allied with Horus. It might be interesting to find out what the origins of that uh, schism in the Mechanicum was absolutely, and, and uh, how it turned out and uh, talk about the other thing I want to talk about. And that is there's some really, really good short stories that I'll try to put a list together. Oh, please do. That, are, that talk about post that book, like what happened on Mars afterwards. Uh, so, so really good stuff. I, I think for, for moving forward anyway. absolutely especially in these early episodes because the mechanicum like doesn't go away <laughs> like oh, no. it's always there so if we can set some some base material up for what to expect as far as mm -hmm. you know why why some are loyalists why some are traitors and so on i think that would be very mm -hmm. helpful for people sure so absolutely. all right friends well that is what we are doing next mechanicum and i couldn't be more excited dan is there anything else you want to say here before we let the people go i think that's it my friend Okay. Well, hey, thank you so much for listening, friends. I hope that you join us next time uh, for our next episode in roughly two weeks. Until then, be safe, be happy, and may the Emperor protect. Boom. Awesome, awesome buddy.